Welcome to the Retro Hack Shack. I'm Aaron Newcomb. On today's episode, I'm going to be rebuilding a Commodore 64 power supply. Now, these things are often tossed out because they are a kind of a danger to use. They could go bad kind of at any moment, and they often do. So people just toss them out. But I think it's better to rebuild these. And apparently Penny does as well. So the other day, a friend of mine was asking me, hey, you said you were going to do a video about how to out rebuild a power supply and uh, you never did it. And I said, I'm going to do it the very next episode. So I'm going to show you today how to rebuild a Commodore 64 power supply instead of throwing it in the garbage. That is, if I can get Penny to agree with me to stop her puppy biting. What do you think, Penny? Is it a deal? All right, it's coming up right now on the Retro Hack Shack. Ow! Every once in a while, I'll see a picture on social media or in a forum where someone is uh, kind of introducing a new find that they got of a Commodore 64 collection or system. And, you know, typically they'll maybe they'll show a picture or they'll describe that it included the original power supply. And uh, inevitably, if you give the uh, post a few minutes, you'll find some comments like these where people are warning that you shouldn't use the power supply because it'll damage your C64. Uh, and other people will join in saying things like, you know, toss that power supply in the garbage or I've thrown out all my C64 power supplies. They're bricks of death. And while all of that is true in terms of the C64 power supply potentially damaging your system when it goes bad, um, I don't agree with throwing it in the garbage. I think it's better to actually rebuild it and save the original case. And that's what I'm going to show you how to do today. Now, before I go through my process for rebuilding my power supplies, I thought it might be good to show you some alternatives if you, you know, choose not to do this process. It does take a little bit of soldering and electronics expertise. So if you're not comfortable with that, there are other options out there. The first one being that you can buy a replacement Commodore power supply freshly made or using recycled products and uh, use that instead. So probably most famously, Ray Carlson has been building these for a, a long time. I don't know how long, uh, but if you go search for Ray Carlson power supply, you'll end up on a page like this. You can see the, the you know, the bare bones model really is just taking two, uh, you know, a nine volt AC and a, and a uh, five volt DC wall warts and kind of putting them together um, in kind of a crude fashion and coming up with a plug that you can then use with your Commodore 64. So, um, you know, he sells quite a few of these. I guess he's uh, refined these over the years or whatever, um, but they they range from, you know, $35 to $80 or something like that. There's also Keylog, I think is how you pronounce that. I'm not sure. K-E-E-L-O-G. Uh, this site offers a bunch of different power supplies as well. They look kind of nifty. Um, you can get them for Commodore 64, 128, Amiga, Atari, a whole range of uh, retro systems. Um, and they, some of them even have OLEDs that show you the current voltage. And I like this one actually, that has two outputs, one for the C64 and then one for the 1541 disk drive. So you can have one power supply that will power both of those units so that's really cool um, and i think these range again from like 35 to 80 dollars depending on you know which one you get don't quote me on that you can look up the prices for yourself um, here's another neat one that i saw it's called new brick and uh, i guess this was a diy effort i like the old style look and feel of it though even though it doesn't it's not exactly like the original power supply i like kind of like the metal i assume it's a metal case i, I don't know it just looks old school and i i kind of like it so i don't know if these are still around but uh, i do like the look and feel 
Now, if you're not into buying a, a new power supply, the, the least you can do is buy kind of a C64 Saber cable that you can use, which will um, also only let through a certain amount of current. And so it's kind of a current limiting device as, as I understand it. And, uh, you know, it can keep your, uh, if you plug in a bad power supply or if the power supply goes bad while you're using it, it'll prevent that current from going into your system. Now, uh, the other thing you can do is you can rebuild your power supply, but not use the original uh, case. And Jan Beta has done this, uh, I think, a couple of times. Um, so you can go and watch his channel or just do a, a search on YouTube where he says, Hi, I'm Jan Beta. And that's my impression of Jan Beta. Hi. It's Jan Beta. And uh, you know, he goes through his method of uh, rebuilding these power supplies. And he did this in um, his own case. He found a case for it, uh, you know, kind of an aftermarket third party case, not aftermarket, but a third party case. And, um, you know, decided to use that instead of using the original case. And this was the case that fit his particular components. So that's another way to go. I do want to say before I get into my version of fixing this is that I first discovered this by doing a simple YouTube search for people that have done this before. And I found this guy, um, Autumn, is it Mike Autumn? I can't remember what his name is. Um, his channel is called Autumn Land and I love the t-shirt, but he actually re he sh kind of showed a method to uh, to use the original case and put new components inside. He added an LED, which I borrowed that idea, which I thought it was cool. So this is where I first got the idea by just looking at what he did. And so I wanted to give credit where credit is due. Thanks to him for putting out that idea. So I have two power supplies here. I've got the uh, this one, which we're gonna be working on today. And that is, uh, it's a, a white version, but it basically it looks the same as this other one, which I've already fixed. And I've just got some uh, uh, electrical tape here keeping it shut. The first thing I wanna do is weigh these two supplies so you can see the difference that it makes when you take the potting compound out. So here's the original. It is very heavy. 1,378 grams, uh, where's uh, pounds? So three pounds six ounces, I think, if I'm reading that correctly. Three pounds, no, it's three pounds, 0.6 ounces. So this says three pounds, just about one ounce, three pounds, one ounce. So let's take that off, pretty heavy, and let's put this new one on. And I'll try not to let the, the cords, okay, so here we go. One pound, six ounces for the new one. So almost two pounds heavier uh, just with the potting compound. And if you're wondering if these are any different at all from each other, uh, obviously the color's different, the, the case itself, at least the, the bottom part of the, the molded case, is exactly the same except for the color. Same size, same amount of ridges, um, but the uh, um, this part, the, the back part, is, is the same except for what's written on it. So if we take a close look on the output side, they both have 5 volts and 9 volts, but the black power supply is rated at 7.5 watts for the 5 volt line and uh, 6.7 volt amps for the nine volt side. And the white or cream power supply is rated at a little bit higher wattage for, for the five volt line, 8.5 watts and uh, um, nine volt amps instead of seven volt amps for the, uh, for the nine volt line. So a little higher rating on this power supply. The reason I bring that up is because some people claim that the cream colored power supply actually doesn't have as many failures as the black color power supply. This could be because of the higher power rating uh, of the cream colored power supply. And as you add more components and more peripherals, perhaps the power draw is what's causing those black power supplies to fail more often. Okay. So as way of explaining what we're going to be doing here, let me show you one that's already finished first, and then we'll go, I'll show you the process I use to take the, uh, uh, the old ones apart. And you can see there's no potting in here. Okay, so underneath these wires, you can see there's a fuse that we'll be adding. There's also a 9-volt um, AC uh, power transformer that takes the 110 volt, 120 volts in, converts it to 9 volts. And then there's also um, a 5-volt switching power supply in here. 
So much better than the simple regulator that they had in the old power supplies. So those are the components that we have inside, and these are all held in there with some epoxy, and we'll get to that a little bit later. But as you can see, if you do this right and you're careful, the, the lid will actually just be able, to, you'll be able to snap that in place. Now it's not really sturdy. Like I said, you can just kind of push on it and it pops off. And that's why I have the electrical tapes on the side. You can't really see it when you're using the power supply, but I put that on there just so it's easy for me to get back into this if I ever need to. You can also see that the, uh, the, the plastics, when you take them apart, right now everything is flat on the old power supply, but when you take this apart, they tend to kind of spring back once you, once they've released from the case. So you can maybe see this lid, for example, is a little bit, uh, bowed this way. And also on the sides of the, of the, uh, power supply case, they're bowed inwards a little bit, just slightly. Now that actually helps keep the lid on. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, it's interesting when you take the potting compound out, the, the plastics tend to constrict a little bit. And one more thing I like to add is a little LED. And I like to put it right in the chicken here, uh, in the middle, kind of like an eye. Um, I don't know. I just like that. But I add an, I add an LED just so I know when the power is on or off. Um, now, whenever it's plugged in, it's going to be on, but you know, it's just a nice little indicator. So before we get too far in, let's just talk about the parts that you're going to need first in order to do this rebuild. Um, you're going to need that 9-volt power supply, and I'll be putting uh, links to these in the description below if you want to make your own. So the first thing I use is a 9-volt AC um, uh, adapter, and this comes from Jameco. Part number is 112336, but I'll put that link down below anyway. Um, so we can take a look at this. It's just your standard wall wart. You can also use an old 9-volt uh, uh, power supply if you can find one, if you have one laying around. You just want to make sure it has um, at least one amp. This one has 1.5 amps of uh, output, so it's uh, plenty big enough to use for either the uh, uh, C64 power supply or even the uh, Commodore 128, I believe, as well. Um, but yeah, this is, a, this is the right size and the right uh, voltage level. And then you need the uh, the Meanwell uh, power supply, which I have here. And uh, this, again, it's sized correctly for both size to fit in the case and also uh, amperage. So this is a five volt switching regulator and it has, uh, I think three amps is what it's rated for. So plenty of power for the C64. And again, I believe I've used this as well with the uh, Commodore 128. You could go a little higher on the amperage, but again, this just fits really nicely inside to th inside this case. The other thing you're going to need if you want to uh, fix these down to the case really nice and tight is some um, epoxy. This is five minute uh, quick cure epoxy, two part epoxy. And then uh, as far as opening the case, uh, you're going to need some other tools. Now, um, there's, I use a screwdriver to open these with. If you're used to opening things like cell phone cases and things like that, you know, there's all kinds of little plastic things and spudgers and little metal things like this, but these are not going to be strong enough to pry this plastic apart. So my recommendation is just to go with a screwdriver. Now, not any, every screwdriver is going to be up to the task here. So I've got three different screwdrivers. Uh, this one is just way too small. If you try to use this to open the, the case with, it's just going to ruin the plastic because there's not enough uh, leverage there. This screwdriver is also kind of small and it does, it has a, it has this concave end to it. Um, it's not tapered very far up the screwdriver uh, shaft. And so again, this is going to be one, too small, but then two, it's going to not really, um, uh, be, you're not going to be able to go in very far to pry with. Now this old screwdriver, this is actually my grandfather's screwdriver. It's got a nice wide tip or wide end on it. And I don't know if you can see this, but it's tapered quite a ways up the shaft. Um, so the taper actually ends like way up here. So it's a nice wedge shape and that's going to allow me to get underneath here and pry around the, the edges of the casing in order to release it from the potting and uh, for us to be able to work on it. 
Now, one more tool that I use sometimes, depending on how, how easily these things come apart, I will very carefully use a razor blade or a, or a cutting tool like this and just get in, try to get in between that plastic. And you have to be very careful because it's really easy to, uh, as you're working with a razor blade, just to go astray here and, and cut one side or another. And that's going to leave the, the case marked up and not looking very good. You're also going to need a fuse holder and an LED for this project. Okay, so you might be wondering where in the world are you going to start prying with a screwdriver because there's no openings um, anywhere here in the case. Well, there is actually. It's actually open here where the cord goes in on both sides. And so if you're, if you're careful, you can actually get under here and get a screwdriver in there and just see, go very slowly on this and take your time and see if the plastic is going to come up well or not. There you go. So hopefully you can see that. Um, you can see the little gap there that's starting to form just by me putting the, uh, the screwdriver in. I'm actually going to use that little screwdriver to wedge that up a little bit. And then maybe I can get this under there. There we go. Another little crack going really slow. And that little creaking that you hear, you can see now the edge is kind of open. And that little creaking that you heard was the, hopefully you heard it, was the uh, those studs that go into the potting coming out a little bit at a time. They kind of crack when they come out. Crack, 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 crack. So let's keep going on this. There we go. There's another one. See that opened up a nice big crack there, nice and clean. There's just this one corner left. Again, I'm going really slow. There we go. In like Flynn. This lid is a little bit different. On the black ones, it has those, like I mentioned, it has those long posts that come down and go into the potting compound. This one actually doesn't have it. So that's interesting. Now we can take a look at what this looks like with the potting uh, compound in there. So here's the uh, nine volt transformer and here is the regulator. Again, not a switching power supply, but just a five volt regulator. And this is what goes bad and causes all sorts of problems. Now that we've got this open, we want to save as much of the, uh, the cording as possible because we're going to be connecting this to the new power supply that we put in its place. So another tool you're going to need is some, some snips here. And just snip this off as close as you can to the potting compound. Try to preserve as much of the cord as possible. Okay, now that I've cut off all the wires, these should just come out of the housing. Just kind of wiggle them back and forth, and they should pop out like that. There we go. Let's set those cords aside so we think we can come back to them and add them back in later. Now that we can see the potting compound, you might be wondering why in the world Commodore filled their power supplies with this potting compound like this. And there's several different reasons why they might have a lot of speculation online. One reason could be is that the epoxy does act as a bit of an electrical insulator and it conducts heat a little bit better than air. Not much, but a little bit better than air. So it would have taken some of that heat off the components and radiated it out to the outside air. Um, another reason could be that they were shipping a lot of these and maybe the potting compound helped keep these cheaper components together in shipping so there wasn't a lot of uh, moving around that could damage the power supply. And remember, this was early on in computer days. So, you know, people were probably knocking these things off their desk or whatever. They needed something really solid. So that's another possible reason. The third reason could have been as a fire hazard or um, to prevent fire inside of the actual power supply. If things did fail and failed dramatically, you know, with no oxygen there because the potting compound was taking up most of the space, it wouldn't have burned very much or very fast. And so it could be that that was another reason why they filled these things with so much potting compound. Why do you think Commodore used all this potting compound in their power supplies? Let me know in the comments below. Now you might be wondering how we're gonna get this uh, potting compound out. What I like to do is just, you can use your screwdriver or just push on it with your, your hands. It's gonna be a little sticky. What you wanna do is you just wanna kinda of crack open, make some cracks on the side here like this so that you can see it's somewhat released a little bit from the uh, edges. And same thing with the back here. Make sure you've got that, you can hear the cracking 
So it's kind of releasing. Sometimes I'll use a screwdriver here as well and just give it a little twist. Not very hard because you don't want it to break, but I want to try to get release these corners as much as I can for the next step. Now to get this out of the case, you're going to need a couple pieces of wood. I was able to find these out in the garage. Couldn't find the ones I normally use, but basically you want these to be, you know, about as tall. Uh, they don't have to be exactly as tall, but about as tall as the case in same width. Now the way this is going to work, you'll notice that these fake plastic uh, cooling fins here that they built into the case kind of protrude out from the case uh, a good, uh, I don't know, three-eighths of an inch or so. That gives us a, 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 a perch, <laughs> I guess, for lack of a better uh, term, um, to put this wood against like this um, so that we can then turn this over and with two pieces of wood resting against this, uh, these fake fins like this, we can start to, we can start to, uh, uh, bang this on the table. This is where you get to get violent with your retro computers and take out all your, uh, frustration and aggression. But, uh, we can actually bang this on the, on a table. This isn't the best work surface. I usually do it out in my garage. Um, and then that will, as we bang that down, the gravity will actually force the uh, potting, uh, this brick of potting to come loose, so to speak, and to, and to come out if you do it correctly. So I'm going to put one of these on one side, like that, and I'm going to put another one on the other side. Again, they're just resting against those on the outside of the case on those plastic fins. And then we're going to bang this down on the table and see if we can dis dislodge that brick of potting compound. Ready? Here we go. Okay. There's so a couple times, and if I turn this over, yep, sure enough, I can see now that this is moving. It might be hard to tell on camera, but I can see that this has come out about a quarter of an inch or an eighth of an inch all the way around. So I think if we give this a couple more bangs, um, it should come right out. Let's try it. Yep, there we go. Two more and it's out. So now you can see what that looks like, that uh, uh, brick from when, once you take it out. And if you look in here, you can see some of those studs that I mentioned, which are just made to add surface area for that potting compound to bind to. And maybe they uh, offer some, some guides as to where to put the components. I don't know. Uh, let's just do a test fit and see if this actually snaps back on. I'm always surprised when this goes back on easily. It seems like it's going to. Yep. There we go. You can see I can pick it up. You know, again, it's not something that you're going to want to probably leave loose. You could, but, uh, you know, it, it just opens up kind of easily. So it's good to affix this with something. But you can see there's actually a pretty good fit without too much, uh, without too many nicks and scuffs along the edge there. So pretty good. Nice little salvage. Okay, now the other thing, if you look closely, you'll notice that this 9 volt power supply is a little big and the 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 higher the amperage the bigger this is going to be so this is about as big as we can fit inside this uh, inside these original uh uh cases for the power supply and you'll notice that it doesn't even really fit in there right so you might be wondering how are we going to get it in there i could put it in like that but then there wouldn't be enough room to put this over there so um what we're actually going to do this is this is this plastic is actually pretty bulky what we can do is we can actually cut along this seam with a Dremel and we can separate the case from the actual transformer and that's going to reduce things by about a quarter inch all the way around and then this will be the perfect size to fit inside the old case. Okay, and through the magic of video editing, I'm back. I went ahead and did the Dremel work in the garage, but you can see what I did. I just went in about an eighth of an inch all the way around where that, uh, where that seam was and I also cut off the the bits that go into the wall because uh, those are going to stick out and make it too long to use those. Um, so I cut those off while I was at it. So let's just see if we uh, can get this apart. Should just be able to go into the groove here and give it a little pry and it should come right out. Let's see. And there we go. We're in like Flynn. Take that out. We won't be using the cord. Uh, it's good to save these though, because you can use these for connecting to other things. So I'll, I'll definitely save this cord. But here's our nine volt transformer. And you can see how much smaller that is than the, uh, 
than the case. It's quite a bit smaller. So when we go to put this in now, uh, we've got you know plenty of room on all four sides to fit that in the case. Okay, so I've cleaned up the, uh, the case. I've scrubbed it down with a toothbrush, got it looking really nice and new, and I've also drilled a hole in here for the LED eventually that will go through there and be an LED indicator. Uh, so that part is done. Now, one thing you might be wondering um, is why the case, why the uh, uh, transformer and power supply are essentially in the top of the case. They're adhered to this side of the case, which makes this feel a little bit top heavy. And the answer is simply because there's really no other way to do it. If you take a look here, um, here's where the wire com wires com would come into the case, the power supply case. And if you look, there's no room for me to put this anywhere um, without the wires getting in the way. So with that in mind, the next step is going to be to break off all of these little uh, posts on the inside of the case so that I can get down there and uh, when I'm ready, affix these uh, uh, parts down in the bottom of the, uh, the top cover, essentially. Okay, those are gone. And my case is pretty rough down here. I have cleaned it up with soap and water and uh, the sticky stuff on the sides is gone. I used some isopropyl alcohol to get rid of that. But down on the bottom here, this is pretty rough. If yours is smooth, definitely this would be a great time to take some sandpaper, 150 grit sandpaper or so, and just rough up down there to give something for the uh, epoxy to adhere, adhere to down there. That'll make the uh, uh, connection uh, the bonding a lot stronger if you take some sandpaper and rough it up. The next thing I'm going to do is go ahead and attach the wires that I need to all the various components. And it's good to just take your time and measure these things out. You want your wires to reach where you need them to go. So for example, in this case, these 9 volt wires, um, once they're all the way down there at the bottom, I just need them to be long enough plus a little slack to be able to reach. I could almost reach these wires and make them work, but they're just a little bit too short and I don't want to, you don't want anything to be really that tight anyway. So, you know, for here, you know, I probably just need like a three to five inch wire to make that connection. Whereas the mains coming in for the extensions for the mains, they're going to have to be wrapped around. And so that's going to need like maybe, you know, five to eight inches. So as you're planning this out and connecting your wires and getting ready to do things, A, leave yourself some slack and B, just Test things out, see where they're going to go, and make sure that your wires are going to be long enough to get where you need to go. One last consideration to make as you're planning uh, where things are going to go is the fuse itself. So we want the fuse to go through the side, through one of these sides, and you can figure out which one you want. But as you're measuring your wire, you know, it's good to know, like, okay, if I put, if I put my transformer here and then I go to put my fuse in, it's going to be really close to um, to touching the transformer. So what I like to do is just offset the transformer just a little bit. And uh, when we put this in now, that'll give us enough room so that we don't interfere with the transformer itself. All right, so I've gone ahead and connected all of the wires that I need to make this thing work. Um, I'll just go over them quickly and then we can do a quick test to make sure everything is working. Uh, before I do, just remember there's uh, live mains power here, so please don't do this unless you're comfortable working on projects like this. You need to be very, very careful where the mains come in when you're going to leave an open project like this and, and test it uh, in the open. You don't want to have something fall here, short, touch, any of that. There's also mains power over here going into this board. So again, just be really, really careful if you're doing a test like this on your bench. I've removed these little... Uh, uh, posts that were on the um, on this board. You could keep those on there if you have a connector that'll work for them. I do not, so I just removed those, desoldered them, and then uh, on this side, this is where the five volts comes out. I've put in two wires into each um, uh, connected to each pad for the five volts in ground. This one, as you can see, is going to the LED. So um, I've already connected that up with. Uh, I think this was something like a somewhere in the 500 ohm range for resistor. I don't want this to be too bright. 
So you have to put a resistor in here because we're feeding five volts into an LED that's rated for, I think, 2.2 volts. So you have to drop the voltage, but I dropped it even a little more so that uh, so we could reduce the brightness on this LED. The other set of wires that I have coming out uh, will go to the uh, Commodore 64. Uh, and then I've hooked up the mains power, as I said. So I've got neutral on one side of the transformer. I've got uh, hot on the other side of the transformer. And then I have two sets of wires, uh, one going, uh, so the neutral is connected directly, but then I have another wire that goes over here to this board, which is labeled neutral and load. So because it's labeled, you know, sometimes it doesn't make any difference, but this was definitely labeled neutral and load. So I connected those accordingly. And then here I have a, another set of wires, one that's going to the, uh, the other side of the transformer and another one that's going to the load side on this switching uh, 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 switching power supply over here. And then this little white thing here is just, I'm just coupling these together because this is where the fuse will go in the end. So the, the power will come in, go to one side of the fuse, and then this little Y connector here where I've got it going to the transformer and the switching power supply will go to the other end of the fuse. For now, I'm not testing the fuse. I'm pretty sure that will work, but uh, I did need to put in something there to carry the power off to the uh, the two separate components here. And uh, last but not least, you do need ground. If I haven't mentioned it before, just a reminder that you do need earth ground on this switching uh, power supply. So uh, I've connected that up as well. And that just goes right back over to the ground that goes out to the wall outlet. So I'm going to go ahead and do a test. Before I do, though, like I said, be very careful of the mains. I'm going to remove any metal objects, clippings from uh, the components I've been working on. Get Make sure those are all out of the way make sure things are safe for me to do so. Now I've connected a meter here so that we can see what the voltage is. I've connected the leads for the meter up to uh, the five volts for now. We'll test that first. And you can see I've put some, just some uh, painter's tape, some, some uh, masking tape over these wires. I don't want those to jiggle around and touch anything or short out. Uh, so I've put some tape over those. So if you can do that, um, you should do that. And then when I switch, I'll move this tape over to the five volt side again, just to avoid any possible shorts while I'm testing. All right, I've plugged it in and uh, I don't know if you can see that, but it says uh, spot on 5.1 volt, which is exactly what you want on this type of uh, power supply. Now, uh, that will drop a little bit once you connect a load. So we've got 5.1 volts, so that's great. If this wasn't uh, spot on 5.1 volts, you could uh, adjust it. There's a little pot right there and it faces that way. So you could take a screwdriver and adjust it. And this is why I'm testing now. I want to test this out uh, while it's on the bench so that I can adjust that and get that to 5.1 volt. Because obviously once you epoxy this into the, uh, the case, you're not going to be able to reach that pot anymore. Now you could uh, if you forget and you uh, don't test the voltage or don't feel comfortable doing it, whatever, you could go back in with some pliers and uh, uh, move this a little bit either way to get that voltage spot on, but much easier to do in this setup here. All right, I'm going to turn the power off and move the, the connectors over to the 9-volt AC side, and we'll test that out. And since I went on a rant uh, a little bit about safety and power, you'll notice that when I unplug the power supply, it takes quite a while for the voltage to drop. It's dropping fairly rapidly, but you know, there's enough voltage probably stored maybe in this big cap here, one of these other ones that you could get a shock. So um, yeah, just keep that in mind as you're working with electronics. Those caps store sometimes a, a great deal more voltage than, uh, especially on this side of the, the cap than you uh, might expect. So I'm sure that if I, if I pick that up from the bottom and touch that, I'd get a pretty nasty shock, pretty big surprise. So be careful. Okay, I've moved my uh, leads over to the nine volt AC. So I need to switch my meter to AC mode and we can plug this in and see if we get and something close to nine volts. It should be nine volts or a little more um, than nine volts, maybe 10 or 11 volts is fine. I plugged it in and we get 10 volts, uh, 10.63 volts. So that should be fine. Once this is connected to a, a load, um, we should be getting uh, um, uh, this 10 volts will be in, in the range that is acceptable for the Commodore 64. These are typically run a little higher so that they can accommodate some load, which will bring the voltage down. So um, 
you know, if you're testing out a power supply and it reads 10 or 11 volts on the AC side, eh, that's probably okay for a 9 volt transformer. And one other nice thing is that since I have this LED hooked up, even though the power's off, you'll see when the LED uh, goes dark completely. And that's a good indication that the uh, power has drained from those capacitors, at least to, to, a, to a pretty good extent. Okay, so now I'm all set up to uh, use the epoxy and get these things seated inside the case. A couple of things to note before I do. Make sure you've got everything ready, I unless you use a longer curing epoxy, which you can get, but this is five minutes. Uh, so unless you've got a longer curing epoxy, you have a really limited time to work with this. It's going to take about 20 seconds or so to mix these two together in a paper cup, paper container. Dixie cup would be perfect, but we don't have any of those. Um, and uh, uh, then you put it in, get your components in, get them set. I mean, five minutes sounds like a lot of time, but really the working time that you have while this stuff is liquid is just a couple of minutes. So you want to make sure you get everything ready to go before you start mixing and get that in the uh, in the case and get your get your stuff in there. The other thing, uh, eagle-eyed among you will notice that I've actually extended this uh, uh, neutral wire a little bit. I wasn't comfortable. It was really tight in there. And uh, I did a dry fit, which is always recommended before you put this in, and it was just really tight. So I added a little pigtail there to extend this a little bit. That'll allow me to get the components in there where I want them to go and have a little room to work with. And last but not least, we're going to be putting the epoxy down here on each side and affixing the components down there, but don't cover up your hole for the LED. So, you know, put a good deal of, of epoxy on either side, but make sure it's not going to run into that hole. Some epoxies are runnier than others. This is pretty thick, so I don't have to worry really too much about that. But if you're using a longer uh, cure time epoxy, some of those can be pretty liquid. And while it's curing, they can kind of like run, run around. So just be uh, uh, conscious of that. One last thing is when I did my dry fit, I did the dry fit with the fuse in here and it looks like it's going to have plenty of clearance. So that's the last thing uh, to test or make sure that you test that before you start the process of putting your stuff in here. Okay. All that being said, it's the moment of truth. Uh, you basically get one shot at this. So uh, you want to make sure, like I said, you have everything prepared. So I'm going to go ahead and mix this and we'll put the components in the in the lid. Make sure you're giving yourself enough epoxy to work with for both components. Uh, you probably want to be a little bit generous because you don't want to run out of epoxy because by the time you do, it's all over and you can't go back and fix it. Okay, now I'm just going to hold these in here and make sure that my fuse has plenty of clearance. It does. Maybe give it just a little bit more room. And I'm going to add just a little bit more epoxy on top of the um, the holes in my uh, switching power supply here to make sure that that is going to stay in there nice and tight. Okay, I'm going to let this set for about 10 minutes or so. And I'll come back and check and see how it's doing. 11 minutes later. Okay, so I took a little break and the epoxy is definitely hard now. Um, you can see that it's so hard. I probably break the... Oh, it did break off finally, but yeah. Super hard. Um, let's just check the components. Yeah, those are in there. They're not, not going anywhere. Um, I can't push on that one as much, but that is in there solid as well. So now we've got the, the case figured out, or the uh, parts epoxied into the case. And uh, I think the next step is going to be to insert the fuse. Now I'm going to use a 4 amp fuse, um, which is a little bit bigger than the one that's in the C64. Really this fuse is to protect against you know, fire or overheating. Let's say something goes wrong, a capacitor fails, and it fails in a short and just starts drawing amperage, this fuse will protect against that and uh, not allow it to get too hot. Um, so this is really to protect the, the power supply or protect from uh, you know fire from the power supply or something like that. Whereas the fuse in the C64 is gonna be, I think it's a two amp fuse, 
maybe 2.5 amp, I can't remember, um, that will really protect the, uh, the C64. But you want to have a fuse here as well, at least I do, which will protect against any of these components failing in a short. So let's go ahead and install the fuse. Okay, I've got the fuse installed. Tighten that up. And that's ready to go. And then before we move on to the next part, I'm just going to go ahead and insert the uh, LED into the hole down below and secure it with a little glue. So before I can connect up the cable that goes to the Commodore 64, I have to trace out these wires and see which wire is what. Now there should be two wires for nine volts. Uh, if you can look up a pinup on a pinup. Now, remember, we have two wires for 9 volts, one for 5 volt, and one for ground. And in my experience, the colors are different. Almost every Commodore power supply I've opened up, it seems, has different colors. So don't trust the one that you did before when you get to the next one. Always test these out and see which cable, which uh, wire goes to what. Now, if you look at the connector, this connector has a little divot on top, and there's uh, four... Um, uh, connectors or conductors on the inside that goes to the goes to the wires. The two on the very top nearest the little divot are going to be nine volts, and it doesn't really matter which way you hook that up because it's AC. So those two, when we tone those out, that'll be simple enough. The two on the bottom, the one on the very bottom, if you hold the jack this way, opposite the divot is ground, and then the one that's just a little bit askew is five. Now there may be uh, some. Uh, connectors that have all the pins. I don't know um, how how common those are, or maybe I'm just making that up. I don't know. But I do know that for this particular pinout for the C64, you've got nine volts up top, ground is directly at six o'clock if you're holding it this way, and then five volt is just at uh, four o'clock there. So I'll uh, tone these out with my multimeter in continuity mode. The other thing that I noticed, at least in this uh, old Commodore cable, is that there's two, um, two of the wires are thicker than the other two. I'm not sure if you can see that on camera, um, but the yellow and the white in this case are thinner. And that leads me to believe that those thinner wires are probably for the nine volt, since uh, that's not carrying as much amperage as the five volt line is. So I'm guessing that probably one of these is five volt and the other is ground, but I might be wrong. Let's find out. These conductors in here are a little bit uh, corroded, and so I'm having to, to rub my uh, probe on there, my lead. Probe lead? I don't know. Probe, I think. Um, and once I've got a good connection, I can definitely see that indeed the yellow or the uh, white one goes up to the 9 volt line, and I'm sure the based on that, the yellow one will too. Yep. So, yep, those thinner wires are definitely 9 volt, and let's see about these thicker ones. So the blue one appears to be ground. It's not very consistent, but uh, you can tell. And then the red one, yeah. The red one is definitely 5 volts. So now we know what these are. We can just hook them up to the corresponding wires that are coming out of our new power supply. Okay, all the wires are connected, and we can... Uh, I put some shrink wrap over the connectors because you don't, definitely don't want to short anything out. And now I'm just going to shrink the shrink wrap and we'll be ready to go. And there's plenty of extra space in the uh, uh, case for these extra wires. You just want to be careful you don't put them near anything that's anything that's too hot. So you can either tape these up to the side or you can just uh, curl them up if you want and push them in there. Things shouldn't get too hot inside here. If they do, that fuse should kick in. Okay, so I've got all the wires in there and it's time to put the cover back on. There's a little bit of a gap here, so I think I'm gonna have to shave a little bit of this plastic off. I may have connected these the wrong way around and they might have been, this one might be just a little bit big, so I'm gonna shave that off and get a nice tight fit. Okay, so I shaved off about half a millimeter or so, just enough to test this out again. Yeah, and that's fitting much better. So before I plug this into the Commodore to do the final test, I want to uh, do one more test very carefully because I don't want to short anything out here, but I want to do one more test with my meter just to make sure that I've got everything set up correctly.
Okay, I've got this Commodore 64 hooked up to my capture card. So let's plug the power in. And fingers crossed, let's see what happens. Got a signal. And there we go. Commodore is working just fine. So now we have a nice, new, safe power supply. It's a lot lighter than the other one and uh, should last a long, long time. But we still get to keep the aesthetics of that original case. So it looks like an original case with a little bonus to let you know when the power is still on. So there you go. There you have it. It's the Commodore 64 rebuilt power supply. Now, I've left this on for a while just to test, and it's not warm at all. Um, probably the warmest thing in here is the LED, and that's not even warm either. So um, I think this power supply is good to go. One thing I want to do, though, before I get done, remember how this kind of pops off if you're not careful? Uh, I want to tack that down just with a little bit more glue. Now, I'm using this uh, E6000 glue here. This is really good hobby and craft glue. It does really good for fabrics, but it also does pretty good for plastics, especially when you don't necessarily want a permanent bond. You want a strong bond, but not a permanent bond. In this case, this clips in pretty nicely, but I don't want it to come off by mistake or if I bump it on something. So I'm just going to put a very small amount of this uh, E6000 glue in each corner uh, of the case and uh, we'll seal it back up and let it dry overnight. If I ever need to get in here for some reason, let's say like in the case of my other power supply, I start getting some singing components or LED goes out. I can cut through this with a craft knife pretty easily and uh, or just pull it apart. It should just kind of snap off as long as you don't use too much of the glue. So there's another Commodore 64 power supply case anyway that has been saved from the landfill and now looks and operates just as it did before, but with updated components inside. I'm sure it will last a long time to come and I don't have to worry about it damaging uh, Commodore 64 when I hook it up. Uh, if there's been a lot of questions about people wanting to send me items, either based on an episode I've done or something, you can find that information, my shipping address in the about page on YouTube. You can also find it, uh, on the, uh, website, retrohackshack.com on the about page as well. So if you're looking for that address, it is there. If you have donations or things that you want to send based on things that you've seen on the channel, uh, hopefully you like this episode. If so, hit the like button. Definitely subscribe if you've seen more than one of my videos and enjoyed it. And I'm looking for a few more patrons on my Patreon page. So go to my Patreon page, sign up and contribute whatever amount you can afford. I'd really appreciate it and it'll help keep the channel running. So with that, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on the Retro Hack Shack. If you want to support me on Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash retrohackshack and sign up. End of line.